Welcome to Focus on Buddhism. Today we will be looking at the most challenging statement ever made by a religious leader, spiritual teacher or any philosopher in the history of mankind. This is the well-known Buddhist Charter of Free Inquiry, which was expounded by the Buddha more than 2,500 years ago. Now the Kalamas, a tribe of people of Kesaputta in ancient India, heard that the Buddha was on his way to their town and decided to go and meet him. The Kalamas were an intelligent and sceptical group of people and, like most of us today, quite legitimately, did not know whom to believe. In their own words to the Buddha, the Kalamas said, Lord, certain Samanas and Brahmins come to Kesaputta. As to their own doctrine, they illustrate and illuminate it in full, but as to the doctrines of others... They abuse it, revile it, and pull it to pieces. Moreover, Lord, yet other summoners and Brahmins, on coming to Kesaputta, do the same thing. When we listen to them, Lord, we have doubt and uncertainty as to which of these revered summoners is speaking the truth and which speaks falsehood. The Buddha said to them, Yes, Kalamas, you may well doubt, you may well be uncertain. In a doubtful matter, uncertainty does arise. Come, Kalamas, do not make a basis for religious beliefs, an authoritative tradition maintained by oral repetition, having its origin in some revelation from a god. Do not make the basis for religious beliefs an unbroken succession of teaching or of teachers. Do not make the basis for religious beliefs report or hearsay. Do not make the basis for religious beliefs speculative metaphysical theories or reasons and arguments. Do not make the basis for religious beliefs a point of view. Do not make the basis for religious beliefs reflecting on reasons. Do not make the basis for religious beliefs acceptance of a statement as true because it agrees with a theory of which one is already convinced. Do not make the basis for religious beliefs grounds for competence or reliability of a person. Do not make the basis for religious beliefs respect, thinking, our teacher says thus. This declaration, perhaps, must be the most rationalistic basis of accepting a teaching, and no doubt today's rationalist will wholly agree on these principles. However, what is perhaps important to note here is that the Buddha did not stop at these rationalistic ideas. He went even further. The Buddha declared that one should know and understand for oneself, and for this purpose he set out a method by which one can verify and be convinced about what one should accept or reject. Undoubtedly, this is the most remarkable aspect of Buddhism. It invites one to come and see, to test it and be convinced about the truths for oneself without accepting anything on belief. The whole of the Buddha's teachings are merely guidelines for one who is willing to take up the challenge. There are no axioms, no assumptions. Buddhas just point the way. In the last section of the discourse, the Buddha drives the argument even further. The skeptical Kalamas were led to a situation where heads you win, tails you don't lose. The Buddha sums up by explaining a method of living which can only lead to happiness. Prakantipalo on the discourse given to the Kalamas. Today I'm going to speak about the Buddha's discourse to the Kalama people, often called the 
the Buddha's charter of free inquiry. <clears throat> However, you should, to understand the Buddha's uh, dis discourse to the Kalamas, you have to know that these people were really intelligent people. They really wanted to understand, they really wanted to know, and they weren't willing to believe anybody. And that's the reason why the Buddha, after uh, he had uh, first uh, met them, he asked them a question, that is, do you have any teacher um, on whom you depend? And they said, no. They said, no, we don't have a teacher, because, you see, there are all these conflicting people come through our place. Eh? All sorts of Brahmins, all sorts of wandering monks, all sorts of people like this. And they all say, you must believe us, you must believe us. We've got the truth. You don't believe those other fellows, they're round the bend. Eh? They don't know what they're talking about. You, you must believe us. So, <clears throat> he... Um, he said to them, well then, you know, uh, gave them ten points of ten reasons why one shouldn't believe. I'm going to read those out to you because um, I think they're very remarkable. You don't find uh, many um, teachers who will make claims like that. They said that um, in the usually in the way of believing in religion you see it can be based on for instance the first one it can be based on um, uh, something that one has heard very often you get to hear a certain teaching many times and you believe it but the Buddha said it's not sufficient reason to believe a thing just because people speak it again and again and again one shouldn't believe that so, Hmm. So, uh, in those days, that meant for those people that um, they had heard the truth um, repeated many times orally, because there weren't any scriptures in those days, and they had heard this truth repeated orally many times, and so then it uh, was fixed in their memory. And the Buddha said, oh, so you've heard a thing many times, that's not enough. You shouldn't believe it on just on that alone. Then he said, um, uh, one shouldn't believe a teaching either on the basis of a line of teachers, you know, kind of apostolic succession or something like that, you see. Yeah. Just because there is uh, a line, a lineage of teachers going back to whoever, whoever was the original one, <clears throat> it's not a good enough reason for believing that teaching. Mm. And uh, then the third one is that um, you know, one shouldn't believe on the basis of somebody else's report or hearsay. Uh, some people are like that. They're easily swayed by what people say. Some teacher has said. Uh -huh. So, pretty stupid reason for believing, but anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, also a possible possibility. Fourth one is perhaps uh, even stronger, more to the point, because uh, he says one shouldn't believe on the basis of uh, what is in conformity with scriptures. Now, as I said to you just now, um, in those days there weren't any scriptures, that is, there weren't any religious books, um, and uh, religious teachings were all oral. But uh, co collections of those oral teachings were remembered by <coughs> monks and um, other wanderers and teachers of those days. They remembered different collections of teachings and then they taught on the basis of that, you see. Well, one shouldn't believe on the basis of whether it's a, an oral teaching or whether it's on the basis of a book. Uh, just because it's contained in some group of teaching shouldn't be believed for that reason. So holy books are definitely out. Uh, just because it's in a holy book it shouldn't be believed. And then uh, uh, there's, uh, the next thing he ruled out was one shouldn't believe on the basis of uh, 
speculative metaphysical theories. Uh, this means the kind of things which um, people believe, um, the kind of ideas, beliefs that they have, uh, which necessarily must be in conflict with the beliefs of others who believe other things. They, these kind of uh, theories cannot be proved. They can't actually be known by people, you see. Yes, uh, Christians believe in a trinity, Muslims believe in one God, you see, uh, one undivided God. Mm. Can't believe, you, can't, you can't prove any of those things, you see. Uh, they, they are just uh, beliefs which are uh, common to a particular groups of people. And the speculation that goes on about them produces a system of belief which after a time hardens into uh, a, uh, some uh, complete uh, system of faith and belief, practice, ritual, but uh, none of those things, the, none of the original beliefs can actually be proved. And uh, so we come to the next one. Next one is, um, shouldn't uh, make any you shouldn't make the basis of your belief uh, a point of view. So, you know, <clears throat> it might be a point of view, it might be inference, perhaps here, the translation not so clear. But, uh, inference is a tricky thing. Uh, people can infer in the wrong way. And it's not uh, clear, actually, whether a... Um, if you rely on inference, it's not always clear that you get at the truth. So, in those days, um, this played uh, an important part in religious debates, which were very popular in India. And um, defeating your rival meant relying on all sorts of uh, proofs that you could uh, conjure out. And uh, one of them was uh, to infer something from something else shouldn't be believed on that uh, score alone. Then, mm. in those debates also, another important thing was arguing upon evidence, which is the next reason for not believing. Some people are very good at arguing, you know. They marshal the evidence and all the facts, and then they argue on the basis of that, that because, um, because these facts are so-and-so, Therefore, so-and-so. You see, and it can be very convincing, apparently. But um, because a person is good at, de at debate and arguing upon evidence, it doesn't mean that they actually have got to the truth of the matter. And so the Buddha is not, uh, doesn't um, trust such a process to lead to the truth. Another thing which um, should not be made the basis of belief is a liking to ponder upon views. Uh, so, if you are uh, that kind of person who who mulls over things in your mind, you think over things, you turn them over, uh, think over it again and again and again, <clears throat> and so you have that tendency in your character, like to to ponder, um, that won't guarantee that you'll get at the truth. One may ponder upon things, um, but um, very likely one may um, adopt the views then which are consonant with one's own character, with one's own leanings, uh, with the, perhaps the views that you have already. Uh, so it really becomes a, a religion of this sort, would become a religion of um, what was convenient, and what fitted in with what you had uh, in mind already. So obviously that won't get at the truth either. The last two points um, concern persons rather than theories. Um, the first one there is... Um, you mustn't uh, base your assumption of truth upon uh, the competence or reliability of a person. Now, uh, the, this is the apparent competence or reliability of that person. This means that you, you see this person, um, you hear them preaching or singing or 
you see them and they're impressive in some way or other and because of that you're swayed now what's uh, of course uh, competent uh, what's judged to be competent or reliable in different cultures is different uh, sometimes it includes a beard or sometimes it includes uh, shaving the head or sometimes it includes wearing this kind of clothes or that kind of clothes you see um, uh, there are all sorts of uh, standards which differ in different societies huh? so when people see <clears throat> a certain kind of monk or priest or wanderer or um, ascetic or <clears throat> whatever it is you see they when they're impressed by that they hear him reciting or singing or intoning or chanting or yeah you know, they're impressed by that <clears throat> and of course the fellow may be just a rogue yeah, no guarantee at all so <clears throat> then um, that's not a that's not a safe ju way of judging the last uh, the tenth <clears throat> one of these reasons why one should not believe is that um, <clears throat> one should uh, not believe saying this monk is our teacher what that really means is that it's guru worship <clears throat> our teacher says this and this and this you see and we believe every word that falls from his golden mouth now, every word is solid truth you see that's the attitude of people who worship gurus. See, uh, even when the guru might be uh, having a joke or something like that, see, a teacher might be having a joke. No, no. People like that, they swallow anything. You know? Now, this is very undesirable. <clears throat> so, these ten reasons for not believing, though, were, don't constitute the whole of this discourse by the Buddha. He deliberately spoke to these people in this way because their character was intelligent and they were also quite sceptical due to the numbers of kinds of teachers that they'd heard. And um, he, uh, he went on in his discourse to them to examine them really, to ask them a lot of questions. And um, those questions uh, boil down to this. Uh, so now what do you think Karl Amos? Huh? when greed hatred and delusion arise in a person do they arise for benefit or harm so you know when the mind is the mind of a person is overcome by selfishness that's greed hatred that's all kinds of aversion and uh, resentment and anger and delusion that's all kinds of confused thinking that can only result in suffering, you see, so that's what they, they answered, yes, suffering. Huh? And so then, being possessed of a mind like that, full of greed, hatred and delusion, well, doesn't that person harm themselves? You see, don't they, uh, for instance, break the five precepts, they kill living beings, take what's not given, wrong conduct in sexual relations, uh, and uh, speaking falsely, and so on? And doesn't that uh, cause harm? Yes, indeed. Which Kalama said, no. And so he asked them. After having asked them about that, um, he asked them, "Well, do you think these things are wholesome? That's the greed, hatred, and delusion, and the actions which are based on them. Do you think these things are wholesome or not?" They said, "Oh no, very unwholesome." Yeah. Uh, so they did you say, "Well, are they blamable or not blamable?" So, oh, they're very blamable. Yeah. What do you think about? Uh, intelligent people will say about these things. Uh, oh, so intelligent people will blame them. Yes. So then, um, then if he do, if a person does things like this, will they bring uh, loss and sorrow or not? Or oh, they will. Yes, they'll bring loss and sorrow. No doubt about that. So therefore, the Buddha said, "Well, that's this is the reason why you shouldn't believe on the basis of those ten things I told you." After he'd gone, after he'd done that, and the Buddha went through the opposites, asking them about non-greed and non-hatred and non-delusion. Non-greed means uh, uh, generosity and renunciation. Non-hatred means loving kindness and compassion. Non-delusion means wisdom and understanding. 
Will those be for benefit or harm? Oh, that will certainly be for benefit. Yeah. So when uh, a person isn't greedy, is not hateful, is not deluded, uh, what kind of actions will they do? Oh, they won't do. They won't do anything bad. Then they only do good things. Oh. So then, um, will these actions be wholesome or not? Yes, they'll be very wholesome. Yeah. And that will they be blamable or unblamable? No, they won't be blamable. So, uh, will they be uh, praised or censured by intelligent people? Oh, they'll be praised by intelligent people. So, what do you reckon? Will they conduce to happiness or not? Yes, they'll certainly conduce to happiness. Hmm. So then the, the Buddha repeated those ten reasons again. So this is the reason, you see, why I said you shouldn't, blame, you shouldn't um, believe on the basis of those ten things. Hmm. Um, then the Buddha went on, uh, he went on uh, to say one or two other things which are important. Um, he um, he um, uh, said that they would get four uh, assurances. Uh, and those four assurances are, are interesting. I'll read them out to you. If there is a world beyond, and there is the fruit and result of karma, well done or ill done, then when the body breaks up after death, I shall arise in a happy world. This is the first assurance. If, however, there is no world beyond, no fruit and result of karma which is well done or ill done, <clears throat> yet in this very life I dwell free of hostility and affliction, sorrowless and happy. This is the second assurance. Again, even if um, having done evil karma, and it is effective in producing a result, nevertheless now I do not think to do evil towards anyone, so how can harm touch me? This is the third assurance attained by him. Again, <clears throat> if not having done evil karma, and it is not effective, that is, it produces no result, then in both ways I hold myself utterly pure. This is the fourth assurance obtained by him. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about these four assurances that you get from practice, it means you, you can see that if you practice Dharma, if you practice the good way in your life, where, what, whatever you believe, whether there is a future life or not, it, you're, you will win, you'll, be the, you'll, you'll have the advantage. You know? So, uh, of course, if you make good karma, if there is, in fact, um, a future existence, and uh, so there, that uh, karma does produce a fruit, and so on, and then if you've uh, practiced in a good way in this world, then you'll get a happy rebirth. Hmm? Uh, but uh, suppose that, uh, in fact, there isn't any life beyond this, you know, and the karma actually doesn't produce any fruit. Well, anyway, as the Buddha says, such a person will dwell free from hostility and affliction, sorrowless and happy. Oh, well, that means that you get the good results in this life. Mm -hmm. And um, even if uh, a person has done evil karma and it is effective in producing a result, still, if one changes to be a person who is uh, happy and uh, at peace with themselves, then uh, they will they will then think, well, you know, that past bad karma that I made, that uh, can't really touch me now, because uh, I'm making all this good karma, you see. And, um, of course, if one's done no evil anyway, and there's no result in, of karma anyway, then you'll be pure in both ways, you see. You, you, nothing, there's no, there's no um, cause for unhappiness or suffering. At the end of this discourse, the Kalamas were overjoyed. The Buddha had very skillfully used their tendency to you know, skeptical doubt uh, to make them see that religion really is a matter of examining things carefully, not swallowing, uh, not swallowing things whole. You examine carefully. You uh, use your wisdom. You develop your wisdom. 
You make your mind bright with understanding. You don't just believe things blindly. This is the message of the uh, the Buddha to the Kalama people, and it rings very true for our days too, because we, like those Kalama people in the past, are now faced with such a variety of teachings, such a vast number of teachings everywhere. We should use this this standard, the Kalama people standard, uh, to examine all these teachings and to see uh, which ones we should take up, which ones we should trust, which ones should be used to guide our lives. That was Prakanti Palo, Abbot of Wat Buddha Dharma, a forest monastery and meditation centre at Wiseman's Ferry. For listeners who are interested further in today's topic, a free booklet on the Kalama Sutta is available on request. Please ring 797 8085. 797 8085. For those who wish to know for themselves the true nature of life, here's a good opportunity to practice meditation. Prakanti Palo will be conducting a nine-day retreat from Friday the 13th of December at Wat Buddha Dharma. Also at Wat Buddha Dharma, Aya Kemma will be conducting a nine-day meditation course from Friday the 3rd of January. Ring 043-731193 for bookings. 043-731193. Sydney Zen Centre has Zen meditation on Monday, Wednesday and Thursday from 7 till 9pm. There are also regular weekend orientation and meditation days. All are welcome. The Zen Centre is located at 251 Young Street, Annandale. The phone number is 660-2993. 660-2993. This program was brought to you by the Buddha Dharma Society of Sydney and sponsored by Mr. Michelle de Grief. May you all be well and happy.